Well, hello, uh, and everyone. Welcome to this sort of second OpenShift on OpenStack um, SIG meeting. The first one was part of a briefing, and Judd Matlin was the one um, who spoke at that one. Um, he uh, gave us a wonderful overview of the reference architecture from Dell of OpenShift on OpenStack. Um, and we thought, because there was such interest in that, we would definitely try and, and host uh, sort of bi-monthly open, open shift on OpenStack SIGs. And today um, we have Judd with us and Jeremy Eater, uh, who wrote a wonderful blog post about his work testing OpenShift on OpenStack on the CNCF lab, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and the CNCF has a cluster, which is a wonderful thing that was donated by Intel and is, I think, at SuperNAP or Switch, one of those places. And it's been a great test bed for us for doing some scaling testing. So we thought that would be a good way to um, open up the conversation. Since this is a SIG um, and not a briefing of sorts, and um, Jeremy is, is kindly um, offered to do this talk, um, we do have a chat for this. So uh, raise your hand in the chat if you want to ask a question. I'm going to unmute everybody. You can self-mute if you have dogs and cats and kids and um, heavy equipment in the back room. Um, but then just raise your hand and ask a question. And then at the end of Jeremy's talk, we'll open it up for a conversation about what this SIG means to you and where we want to go with it. All right. So I'm going to turn, let Judd introduce himself, and then we'll kick it off. Thanks a lot, Diane. Um, my name is Judd Malton. Uh, I'm a principal systems engineer at Dell. Um, and uh, my job these days is to write a reference architecture um, and deployment guide for deploying OpenShift 3.3 on the, uh, the latest uh, OpenStack platform from Red Hat <clears throat> and address all the issues uh, and hopes and dreams of folks delivering uh, OpenShift on top of any stack of on OpenShift on top of OpenStack in whatever uh, vendor configuration you like and act as a uh, an emissary into OpenStack in order to promote features that are most helpful to uh, OpenShift Kubernetes uh, and that whole infrastructure. Um, we, as the chairman of the SIG, uh, I'm really interested to hear from you all about um, what you might need from OpenStack uh, in order to accomplish what um, you need to do on OpenShift. <clears throat> um, and also what you might want to talk about, um, successes, failures, war stories, um, to share with the group and get more uh, knowledge about this popular stack. Um, we have the gathering coming up right before um, KubeCon in Seattle in early November. Uh, looking forward to seeing a whole bunch of folks there uh, and learning and teaching tons about what we're doing. Um, the, uh, uh, my work is available through, unfortunately, your Dell sales rep. Um, and I'm also very proud and surprised that Intel bought the thousand nodes of, uh, of Dell gear, Dell R630s, which um, are featured in my reference architecture for OpenShift. So we can actually go pretty deep into the configuration of these boxes. So you really know what to order when you're looking at deploying this stuff. Um, that's it, I guess without further ado, um, again, uh, ping me um, if there's stuff you want to uh, talk about and collaborate about. Um, I'd uh, I'd like to uh, thank Jeremy for for going over this, and I'm excited to to dig into uh, into what they accomplished at the CNCF lab. Jeremy. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeremy Eder. I'm an engineer in the performance and scale uh, engineering team at Red Hat. And uh, these past couple of years, I've been working on OpenShift container technology in general. And in the month of uh, June or May, uh, we became aware of the CNCF environment that it was going to be uh, become available. And we had a, a product need to get some um, additional scale testing done. And here we are. So we were able to use that lab. And I'll go over some of the details uh, about how we used it and why we did things in a certain way. And um, and some of the results, you know, which are uh, 
which are, I guess, the most interesting part. And for me, I guess the journey was equally interesting. Uh, a lot of work came out of it, and there's more work to go. But uh, and we're actually right now gearing up for uh, an additional scale test. You know, we're going to do these as often as we possibly can. So we're gearing up to um, do new, uh, revise this type of a test, and hopefully achieve even greater numbers. So hopefully, in front of you, you'll see a red slide. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what I, I, I guess I. I figured maybe it would be interesting to take you guys through uh, how we turn requirements into results from our perspective. And that will start with um, the lofty kind of marching orders from the product managers saying, you know, here's what we need to do, uh, or here's what we'd like you to try and get to, and you tell us how realistic this is and go try it anyway. <laughs> um, how CNCF got involved, I, I want to share with you uh, the deployment of the OpenShift on OpenStack at scale that we did, which we learned a lot from and um, uh, is feeding into our product documentation and our own reference architectures along these lines. Um, I also wanted to take you into some of the details about how, how we actually do our testing because the results and the numbers have less have more meaning that way if you understand what um, how we are actually exercising the environment. Some results, these are the ones that are shared in the blog. So if you've read the blog already, you'll have seen some of these results um, and then hopefully some Q&A. And as I'm going through this, I didn't prepare a terrible amount, you know, uh, but so so please do feel free to ask questions. Diane, I cannot see the chat while I'm looking at the slides. So just, you know, interrupt me if there's questions and okay. if I'm going off in the wrong direction, just refocus me here. Uh, okay. so. What did we set out to do? Uh, we get a product requirements document from the product managers in a release planning phase in advance of uh, code freeze for OpenShift 3.3, which I guess was a couple of months ago now. And our goals were pretty lofty. Um, along the way, we've been getting more and more information and, and feedback from the field that uh, density and consolidation is a very important um, attribute for the system. So to that end, we decided to try and up the number of pods that can be supported per node. OpenShift provides an Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana-based uh, stack for consolidated logging. We wanted to exercise that at as big a scale as we can. It also provides a Hocular, Heapster, and Cassandra-based metrics uh, stack that runs again all the, actually logging and metrics all run as pods on top of open shift uh, so we wanted to test that and then we also had a, a like a full density kind of uh, it's more of a control plane exercise at full scale at as dense we as we could get so let me just say one thing before I continue um, the support statements that come out of OpenShift and out of Kubernetes are generally around how many pods you can run and how many pods you can run at a certain number of nodes. So it's it's a little bit difficult to grok, but the the idea is that fewer pods, you can have fewer pods on, on nodes, the more nodes you have. So at full scale, thousand nodes, we're not being we're not doing 250 pods, we're doing half of that. And so if you needed to get to 250 pods on a node, you would only be able to have 500 nodes. In other words, 125,000 pods currently is the maximum for OpenShift 3.3. So the idea was, okay, given these type of marketing marching orders, what, what, how the heck are we going to do this? How are we, where are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? And we already have the why. So from there, um, we, we had a previous relationship with Chris Ansick from uh, CNCF and um, and Dan Cohn. So we discussed our use of their lab uh, extensively. And what ended up happening was um, we were allocated 300 of those physical nodes. So everyone was bursting through doors and windows like the Kool-Aid man saying, OK, we got this kick-ass gear. Uh, it's super high-end stuff. We really can't even get higher-end stuff, even if we had infinite budget. Because um, you know every system has an NVMe device, for example. There's just 14,000 plus cores that were available here. 
Um, really, really awesome gear, Dell gear. And uh, plenty of RAM. Basically, we, we wanted for nothing in terms of infrastructure here. 10, well, I will say this. Um, the 10 gig NICs, we, we probably could have used a few more of those. But anyway, so it that's the hardware stack, Dell PowerEdge R630s um, with, uh, with Haswell chips and 256 gigs of RAM. So really great gear for being able to do the try and hit the targets that we are trying to get to. So in other words, we didn't have any hardware limitations. We were able to focus ourselves on the software, which was which is really untying our hands in a lot of cases. Um, when we try and do scale testing, sometimes it's a mix of, well, we don't have the hardware to do that, or, well, we don't have the software to do that. In this scenario, the hardware question was answered for us, thankfully, um, by CNCF. So here we are. That's the left-hand side of the page. Um, right bottom quadrant talks about the versions of... Uh, before you get to the software, um, I'm curious if you know what sort of um, northbound uh, networking gear is involved. For our Dell RA, we have a full cross-linked uh, HA uh, switch infrastructure, both for uh, um, northbound and east-westbound across racks. Our solution in our RA goes up to three full racks. This is a lot more than three full racks, but you could still get a lot of processing power. So what? What a, do you know um, who is supplying, supplying the networking gear? You know, the lab was turned over to us as as machines. So I don't, I don't, I, I know we had uh, uh, problems at the network switch level uh, with dropped packets that we were working on for a while that that ended up getting resolved. We also had um, driver bugs in the Intel um, i40e driver that made it look like there might be switching problems when there weren't. So I don't actually know what the uplink switch models were. I believe they were, I believe they were Cisco, but I could be wrong. So uh, this on the software side, again, this is one of those things where, you know, the next time we go through the CNCF work, um, one of the main requests we had was, can we have read-only access to the switches, for example? And they were not set up in a multi-tenant fashion that would allow that in a, in a way that the ops guys over there were very comfortable with. So um, one of the ideas was to dump the switch configs for us every day and, and you know, uh, process them such that they, we only see what we're what we're supposed to see or, or even do it more often than that so we could have at least a text-based output we were looking for things like um you know is the switch dropping packets do we have a link uh we actually had a bunch of link errors you know just driver bugs on you know that were related to even establishing link with the switches so those are things that were difficult to debug without access to the switching uh, uh infrastructure and that's just the nature of the way this lab was given to us at the time so Part of our feedback to them has been we would like read-only access or something similar uh, around the switching, as well as, you know, we need we, we would love to have like NetFlow um, type data from the switching to understand if we're hitting uh, a cross-connect link uh, contention or, you know, bandwidth issues along those lines. That we, we never did stress the, the, the networking plane to the point where we we're pushing 10 gigs of traffic. Um, but from a functional functional standpoint, it might have speeded up our debugging. That's very lab specific. It really didn't have much to do with uh, OpenShift and OpenStack. But you know, since you asked, uh, okay. So we we did deploy with RHEL 7.2. Um, we had to upgrade to RHEL a RHEL 7.3 development kernel in order to pick up the driver fixes that I had mentioned earlier. The the bugs that were fixed upstream that are that weren't fixed at the code level we we had at the time. They're they're fixed at this point. Um, and then OpenStack, Red Hat OpenStack Platform 8, which is based on Liberty, if you're familiar with their naming scheme, um, a bunch of patches that are, again, publicly released uh, errata. And we used OpenShift 3.3, which was in alpha, alpha uh, stage at the time these tests were run. So um, that's the mix of hardware and software resources that we used. Now, for, for private cloud, this is probably a fairly standard config. Um, Maybe it's a little bit larger. Maybe the nodes are a little bit nicer than than many people can afford. But um, scaling those down, you know, I, I would think this is a pretty happy path for for customers who are doing private cloud at this point. 
Um, there were a lot of there were a lot of things that were more nice to have than need to have in this environment. The NVMe devices go in that category, but uh, they were certainly we certainly put them to good use once we figured out you know how to wire those into OpenStack. Okay, so any questions about the hardware or software configs? Um, nope, looks good to me. So the logical diagram that we built is on the right, and uh, hopefully you can see that. There were the, the, the colors are blue is a physical node and green is a virtual node. And what we did was we created two different host aggregates, which are essentially like regions or zones. And in each one of those regions, we deployed a separate OpenShift installation. And the reason we did that was, was only because we had more gear than we needed to get to a thousand nodes. And we wanted to run um, different tests that would have otherwise interfered with each other, OpenShift tests. So we were able to parallelize a bunch of stuff by doing that. And that's why you've got the curly braces one comma two there. There were actually two mirror images of these sharing the same um, open stack control plane. And so you've got those for the infra uh, high, uh, host aggregate zones, which are OpenShift has the concept of uh, masters, which are API servers, uh, and etcd nodes, which are key value stores that, that store all the persistent state, cluster state, and the masters talk with the etcds directly. Um, and then there's also actually not on this diagram, but there's a load balancer in front of those masters, which is a single endpoint that all the nodes talk with. So that's just another VM. And we did end up with only three. This diagram says that it goes up to you know master n. There was actually three masters and three etcds. Um, and then there was a support of availability zone or or host aggregate. And in there we stuck the routers, registries, um, metrics, and logging pods that were in use. So. The third part was a catch-all, which was everything else. Um, in our case, it ended up being just nodes. And there was a fourth, actually, where we stuck a bunch of uh, servers we had in reserve where we ran our workload generators from. And those are just bare metal rel nodes um, that, ha and our workload generator currently uses JMeter, so it generates um, web traffic. Some of the flavors we used are at the bottom of the diagram here. Um, all of our nodes were uh, four vCPUs, 16 gigs of RAM, and 32 gigs of disk. And those were probably larger than we needed, but um, it's kind of the thing where we had a bunch of hardware, we figured we would um, use all of it. And then the the etcd servers and infra nodes, those definitely need to be beefier. There's a, depending on the type of test or, or workload that's going on, you, you generally need more CPUs to handle the metrics and logging and the router and registry, depending on if you're doing web traffic, you know, the routers would get busy on CPUs. Um, the registries do a lot of CPU activity, but mostly disk activity. And so uh, the nodes tend, the, um, Infra and FCD nodes tend to be need a little bit more uh, CPU resources. And then finally, the most the most CPU intensive ones are the masters, and those are the ones that are constantly busy uh, doing command and control traffic with the nodes. Um, part of our effort in this time frame was to improve those command and control uh, channels, and we've done that in a couple of ways. First of all, we've put in uh, some some uh, caches. And we've done, we've added some etcd watches. Uh, if you're not familiar with those, a watch is a persistent connection that a node will establish on the master that allows it to, or sorry, uh, yeah, via the master, that allows it to be constantly updated with um, status changes from the cluster. So a node will immediately know whether or not a new node became available and it knows how to route packets to it because um, it, has, it has received that update. So those watches are uh, a current point of command and control that, that has gone under optimization. And, and the main thing we've done is move from JSON-based uh, packet payloads that encapsulate all of the um, data about state over to a protocol buffer, which is uh, binary encoded and thus much more CPU efficient to encode and decode than JSON is. Um, I, Basically, we found that Golang's 
JSON library was um, or could use some optimization. And, and so the Google team has invented protocol buffers, um, which though they're in use in more than Kubernetes, but we applying them to Kubernetes allowed us to reduce the CPU usage, uh, I believe from 22 cores down to 15 cores or so. So maybe a 30 or 40% in improvement in the number of cores it takes to manage a thousand nodes. A tremendous improvement um, between the caches and the uh, protocol buffers. So phenomenal scalability improvement there. So for a while to get to these numbers, we were just throwing more hardware at it. And make, and that's why the masters are 40 vCPUs. At a point we were up to 22, you know, and uh, we really felt like we didn't want to be bottlenecked on CPU, so we threw as much hardware as we could at it. And at this point, what we're doing is whittling down those numbers to um, to allow the masters to be just be just be the overall efficiency in the control plane is is what we're trying to address. And in order to do all of that, not only did we involve all of the special interest groups in in Kubernetes land, like particularly SIG scale, um, but also OpenShift engineering, quality engineering inside Red Hat, um, the OpenStack engineering group, our group, the performance team, and then um, analogous to the teams that, that Judd is likely on, we have reference architecture teams, which are um, writing documents that um, represent these best practices that we learned. And then finally, there was a, a funny bit around Ansible, which I'll get into in a minute, um, that we identified some um, some issues with uh, some scalability issues in, in their code base. And if you haven't seen or used OpenShift yet, um, the installer for OpenShift is written in Ansible. Before you go on, um, I was curious about um, the load balancers not pictured here. Um, what was your load balancing solution? And did you have two with a VIP? Um, did you opt for OpenStack's built-in load balancer? How'd you go about it? Yeah, the, so the load balancer as a service in OpenStack is is not yet actually supported by Red Hat. And so what's used in this installation is the native load balancer, which is HA proxy based, which comes with OpenShift. Whenever you install OpenShift with more than one master, you will automatically get, uh, and you have to configure you know, a load balancer node, you will get um, a single load balancer with uh, with you know an IP address, so there is not an, a, a fault tolerant config there um, in our environment here. So I'd have to double check. I'm I'm fairly certain that 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 is a tunable option to have multiple software load balancers, and it's not so much for balancing a tremendous amount of load as it is for providing a single endpoint for all of the nodes to access, rather than doing maybe round robin DNS or some other thing to to spread that load out. But the idea is that a single master can't handle the amount of traffic that a thousand nodes generates. So you have to spread it out somehow. And the proxy is the load balancer does uh, fans that out for us. And then just an equal weight scenario. Thank you. So we have the environment, let's say we have that environment built out. Um, what are some of the things that we wanted to test? Our team is, uh, again, we're on the performance team and we collaborate with our, our quality assurance guys to develop tests for OpenShift. And um, so our repository is linked here. It's called SVT and I didn't name it, so I don't know why it's called that, but other than the fact that it stands for system verification and test. Um, so those are open source. You can grab them right now and look at what we do. Um, there's four main things that are in there at least from my point of view, there's actually a fair amount more. But the main and interesting ones for this, for uh, the subject matter we're going over are a cluster loader, network tests, workload generator, and then we've got some reliability tests, which were, we look for memory leaks and connections that don't close properly. Um, there's a fair amount of uh, TCP connections, HTTP connections in the system. We wanna make sure that we are not leaving sockets open and uh, you know that would potentially build up to the point where there's you've got that type of exhaustion and memory leaks, et cetera. So we've got some reliability tests that run for, uh, generally run for um, anywhere between 10 and 14 days. I didn't mention it here because it's 
in, in that list just because it wouldn't fit on the page. But we, we also, a, a key piece of what we do involves this image provisioner. And what this is, is it, it takes um, a rel cloud image, which is a very minimal QCOW image or an Amazon AMI uh, or any other public cloud. And it turns it into an OpenShift node that's got no configuration on it um, in terms of OpenShift. So it'll set up the partitions, make sure that the Docker storage is set up correctly, um, bakes in, you know, a lot of, I mean, this, tech, this type of image, gold image technique has been around forever. This is just automating it through Ansible and wiring in the OpenShift specific bits, which are really just pre-pulling a lot of the images that are required to run OpenShift. So if you've seen it before, there's like OSE pod, OSE router, OSE um, itself. And, you know, there's maybe a dozen of them that we need to pre-pull onto each node. The reason we do that is because if you're doing thousands of nodes or a thousand nodes, going over the network um, becomes a point of contention to pull all of that stuff. And so baking it into the images became um, a necessity actually in order to get anything done in the timeframes that we had. So what we did is we pushed this up into GitHub. Uh, you can use it yourself right now. And um, it's, you know, as long as you configure an inventory file for your environment, it will spit out a QCOW2 or it will also spit out an Amazon AMI that has all of this stuff uh, baked in. So a means of self-defense really to get work done. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do this, but it will take you a lot longer um, if, you, if you didn't do something like this. So this so takes the load off of your, your um, RPM repos and your Docker registry, correct? Those are the primary two things that you get, yeah. Yep. And we did some stuff, like we put our monitoring solution in there. Our, our, we have a, a metric system and monitoring solution called pbench. We wanted to bake that in. Uh, what that does is gather system metrics and provide graphs for us uh, at the system level so that we can understand, you know, when we run these tests, what is the impact and efficiency? Uh, I mentioned, you know, dropping from 22 to 15 cores. Um, that was, uh, we measure that with uh, the pbench utility. So yeah, there's a, a, the main two wins from a shared infrastructure standpoint are the registry and the yum repos or the, yeah. Okay, so now we've got OpenStack, OpenShift on top, and we've got our, uh, and we've got our images deployed. The cluster is built at this. Let's assume the cluster is built at this point. Again, what do we do with it? We designed some tests that are centered around a shared web hosting scenario, which uh, is kind of the bread and butter for Kubernetes and OpenShift at this phase in its life. We expect that to change drastically over the next year or two. But right now, uh, it's centered around 12-factor application development um, and web-based, you know, web languages like Mongo or Postgres and Node and PHP or whatever else your favorite thing is. Um, OpenShift itself ships examples, which are templates, and uh, we've used those and adjusted them to our needs. So what we've de also developed a utility called uh, the cluster loader, and it shows up in the blog. What it is is a way to express an environment um, that consists of all the complexities of, uh, of, of Kubernetes, like represent really what a customer is trying to do or a user is going to do. It'll include replication controllers, secrets, um, uh, templates, pods, services, routes, all that stuff, and allow you to express it in a very human-friendly way, and have this script go off and populate the environment according to your according to your wishes. So the link is there, and um, if you were to explore it, you'd find directories like we've got uh, the basic pod manifest, we've got the basic replication controller manifest, and all this stuff is templated to allow us to build as if we had a box, you know, as if we had a, a tub of Legos and we could build whatever we wanted to with these with these building blocks. The config directory contains, and I'll show it to you in a slide, just the guts of, of what the cluster loader will go off and do. And it's a Python script right now, and we have some plans on how to improve it, uh, as you could imagine. Anyway, so that's the config and content directories, including the templates, you know, cluster loader, the Python script itself, which takes only two arguments, you know, um, what actually one argument, what file am I loading it from? And uh, optionally second arguments around using the workload generator portion of cluster loader. Uh, and then of course, a, a utilities that's got a, just a bunch of functions in it. So that's the framework that we use to test 
OpenShift. And the architecture is pretty simple, um, and probably the most simple flowchart you can have. Start it off, filter the arguments, um, create a namespace or a project in OpenShift parlance, and within that namespace, create however many things you want to represent what your applications might be doing. Quotas, users, pods, et cetera. Uh, and then at the end, iterate until you've reached the total number of pods and then exit. And at that point, we'd have an environment that's ready for the second phase, which is um, actually putting work on it. So this is the first phase. And oftentimes, uh, this is the only phase that matters because potentially we could be using this as not only the loading utility, but also benchmarking how quickly do we load applications. When the cluster's under load, what is the API response, server response times, et cetera, under load? And additionally, how many CPUs does it take us to get this, a certain fixed amount of work done? The test we ran inside CNCF um, is, it's, the guts of it are pretty lengthy and the actual test is on the blog, but here's an example that we, um, here's an example that's in our repository and the, the number of projects is really all that changed here. Um, this is on the left top, you'll see the number is only five. So it would deploy five projects, each with one user, um, with three templates inside of uh, a build configs, six build templates, one image stream, two um, replication controller templates, we each of one of those with 256 byte secrets, um, uh, secrets and routes. And the idea here is that if you have all of this within one namespace or one project, you have pretty much what a user, or what a developer might try and deploy on OpenShift. And, uh, you know, we can bike shed about the numbers. And the idea here is to provide a framework and allow you to have uh, tools to experiment on your own. These configs are what we've arrived at internally for what we expect people to do, but could be right or wrong, uh, depending on you know what whatever you're trying to load onto the environment. So for example, um, Java apps malloc their memory up front. They are not they they you'll you'll get less density because there's no ability to overcommit with Java. So for example, your projects number if you're using um, JVMs would be lower than on the same gear, but you're writing in some interpreted language like um, like Node or um, or PHP, where you can overcommit memory. So instead of five, we tried to go as high as we could until failure. And this is roughly what we this well, this is exactly what we got to. Um, thousand nodes, thirteen thousand projects. Our target was twenty thousand. We didn't get there in the time allotted. Uh, fifty two thousand pods, you know, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but the numbers are pretty pretty impressive, I guess. And I think um, we learned a lot. you know, we learned a lot about where to adjust to config, what to fix. And the deliverables were there were bug fixes, a lot of them. And a lot of it actually ended up being documentation as well. For example, if you're doing logging scalability, or if you're doing a big environment and you want the, you know, the the um, Elasticsearch to scale, here's the three or four different, you know, things you need to do. For example, uh, System D has a thousand messages a second rate limit by default. If you have a large environment, a thousand messages a second might be nothing, and so you would want to adjust those types of things. And, and that's the type of stuff we hit at scale that a smaller environment would never encounter, or would likely, you know, likely not encounter. Uh, okay, so some of the stuff we did encounter on the way to those numbers were um, we noticed that etcd took uh, more disk space than we were initially recommending. So we've since gone from a 20 gig recommendation up to a 40 gig recommendation, even though only 13 gig is ever consumed in our test. This is the left graph uh, around, I guess, midnight or so, the blue line, where you know, we're somewhere around 13 gigs of data. And uh, so we're, we're recommending 40 at this point, and that's probably um, at least twice what you would actually need for a massive cluster. So, um, and actually the etcd space tends to vary based on how many images you have and how many pods you have, uh, sorry, no. It ends, it ends up varying quite a bit around the number of images that are in your registry, because we do store some metadata 
about the image in etcd and so a lot of the disk space is not necessarily about the number of nodes routes projects etc as much as it is around the number of images so for the next generation test um, you can imagine we're going to pile on the number of images and come up with the uh, exact capacity planning formulas around around what you can expect there and then on the right hand side towards the right hand side of the graph you can see um, a fairly busy cpus that suddenly dropped off and uh, yeah that was a bug that we encountered and um, that's actually where we ended our test pretty much because we had just run out of time so we got that's how we got to 13,000 projects instead of 20,000 that's basically the point where things fell over um, and yeah we had to bail at that point because the gear was being taken away so that's where we ended up with uh, and that bug is fixed in Kubernetes as well as OpenShift 3.3 at this point. So if we had the gear again, we would get well beyond 13,000 um, projects. And, that, and that's what we're hoping for is to get the gear again and, and do another run through, so. Yep. Uh, a question about eight o'clock uh, in the morning, follow on the left slide, the left graph. Um, does, the C, does the disk utilization go back down because you withdrew the number of images? Yeah, so, well, not images, but total content. So one thing I forgot to mention, I guess, is that the cluster loader also has a teardown phase. And depending on how we've configured it, um, the growth is attempt, it, the growth occurs as quickly as possible and the teardown occurs as quickly as possible, but there's a steady state that it, it tries to uh, maintain between setup and teardown so that we can kind of examine what's going on. And so the fall off is because we're trying to tear it because actually um, another data point that was asked for was how quickly can we delete stuff or not really how quickly, but are there any issues with, with project deletion speed, et cetera. And, and to be quite honest, um, we did file bugs based on that and they're um, being worked. So I think that was pretty useful. And that, that was really the whole purpose of getting this CNCF cluster access too was it, it was a huge opportunity for us to, to do this kind of testing and it's pretty pretty awesome offer on their part and on Intel's part. Yeah, and sending you know requests for this type of usage is nothing more than a PR to the CNCF GitHub repo. Um, we have some plans as their environment uh, expands to start using it again for newer versions of our product you know so this gave us a lot of homework to do these tests and these results and it those are not fixed overnight they involve coordination with upstream developers and productization on our part so it's not the type of test we could immediately repeat anyway so it kind of gives us some think time um, in the interim while we're uh, scheduling ourselves for getting back on the gear where, you know, this was a lot of stuff that we learned. Um, I might have a, I'll just skip ahead. We we filed uh, somewhere around 30 plus bugs around this, uh, this effort. And a lot of them were in core Kubernetes. We found one kernel bug. Um, and, you know, but for the most part, these are solved at this point. I think there's there's some outstanding, but none that are related to scale and none that we consider blockers. There's there's actually there's zero blockers that we're aware of on OpenShift 3.3 at this point, um, given the scale numbers that we're quoting for support. So going beyond that, you know, there's dragons there most likely, and uh, that's actually the, the the scope of our next uh, set of scale tests, which we're working on right now. That should be the name of the next blog post. There be dragons there. <laughs> Yeah, so the idea is to push Kubernetes to its, to its just, you know, I mean, our job is pretty cool. We're, we get to break stuff and, and try and put the shattered pieces back together as quickly as possible. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the, or, or crawling over broken glass as a service. <laughs> so I should say this before I continue is that, you know, I'm here talking with you, but there was at least six people uh, involved in this Tim Sinclair and uh, Mike Fiedler being the primaries, a um, couple of Ansible folks that helped us along the way, really a team effort overall, not just, uh, definitely not just me, uh, more of the coordination point of everything. So the Ansible issues that we encountered were between OpenShift 3.2 and 3.3, we pulled in a new version of Ansible because we wanted some of the features 
and we got those features, but we also got a performance regression. And what you're looking at is actually the 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 uh, the after. Um, the before the before was so bad that you could really not even capture um, stats because it never really even completed. The issue is that the is linked off there um, at the top of this slide, and you know it was essentially a recursion of Ansible um, tasks that was spiraling out of control and just ending it or just being in these infinite loops where every CPU was just pegged and, and the system would um, the system would crash essentially. So that bug's resolved in uh, Ansible 2.2, which is the version that will be included with OpenShift 3.3. So we're, we're well beyond this. And you can see now, um, actually the y-axis of this graph is no, is um, percent of cores. So 15K is actually 1500 uh, percent, which means 15 cores. This is a 16 core system for a while there. And what it's doing at the spike is um, actually all it's doing is reaching out and collecting all of these facts about a thousand nodes. And so that that takes a lot of CPU to gather all of that stuff together and uh, actually takes a lot of memory as well. So this we couldn't even get to this point in the installation um, with some of the other versions of Ansible. So those haven't seen are not supported on OpenShift. They're, they work just fine at smaller scales, but when you start scaling out to the thousands, you start seeing these issues. And uh, so what we've done is we've got a version of 2.2 that we're packaging with uh, with OpenShift itself. Okay, those are the bugs, and I think that might be it. All right, um, let's see, we've got a bunch of people on, and I'm wondering if anybody has any questions here. Nobody asked any in the chat. Uh, Sandeep? So essentially, you have Sandeep? the function of the Docker, right? So the Docker, the, the Docker format package, the Docker file, there's a lot more to it, but the Docker yeah. file is like a spec that you can the details you can build in the same format. And all the I'm not able to make it out, yeah, sorry. Neither am I. Sandeep, um, I know, can you type your question in? As layers, the layers can be. For example, let's say you wanted to um, develop. Yeah, of, the microphone's not working very well. No, no, six on top of well seven. Okay. Yeah. You get a well six base in the other zone with one hour register. Sandeep, um, your, your microphone is not working correctly. Can you type your question into the chat or your comment? Yeah, he was breaking up pretty good there. In the meantime, I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your OpenStack deployment. Uh, was this triple O and director running typical OSP stuff? Um, and did you run into anything interesting? Yes, it was typical OSP stuff. Uh, things we ran into were, because we were using OSP 8, um, Everything we hit had been already been fixed, and uh, so we pulled some packages back. Uh, we had a, a, a small issue with heat. Um, OSP D needed uh, a newer version, slightly newer version of uh, RabbitMQ. Not OSP D, but the cluster needed a slightly different version of RabbitMQ because um, there were some scalability issues in the versions that were um, that we were running. So the idea was that if we were running later versions of code, we would not have hit these issues. And the idea was at the time we run this, eight was the latest GA um, version of OpenStack from Red Hat. And so we did the best we could with the latest GA. Um, you know, we, we weren't necessarily about um, OpenStack as much on this test. We, we were kind of just using it as a, as a cloud because we wanted to get to a thousand and we only had 300 nodes. Um, in future versions of open of this type of testing, we're going to do a lot more stack integration. For example, 
Um, we've got these heat templates. Uh, we'll use those, you know, and, and we'll use the latest version of OpenStack Newton, which is version 10 in, in Red Hat land. Um, and the latest version of OpenShift, we'll use those hemp temp heat templates to do the deploy. Um, we'll be integrating with Cinder and Gluster, and uh, we'll likely get rid of the double VX LAN encapsulation. So trying to do uh, a lot more of benefiting from running on an OpenStack cloud than we did in this test. In this case, it was mostly about providing VMs for OpenShift to, to run on. Um, so yeah, so the heat issues, RabbitMQ was a little bit of an issue for a while. And then, to be quite honest, we were blaming software for a lot or blaming OpenStack and OpenShift for problems that were really driver bugs in the Intel driver. And that was, and, and we actually had to flash firmware on a bunch of the Intel mix as well. So the reason was because we were one of the first folks to get on the CNCF lab and they were extremely helpful, but it didn't save us any time having to, you know, having to ferret those issues out. As you can imagine, without access to the switches, this was a bit of a mystery for us. So uh, it took a couple of extra weeks to, to, to um, to, to nail all of that down and finally got to the point where everything was super stable. Um, same for those issues. Yeah, really just heat and rabbit were the two issues that we uh, we encountered. There's one more question that pop, popped up too. Um, Aresh um, is asking, does the whole thing work on, on the RDO triple O to try it out for a POC? So uh, we've done it on eight and um, I cannot imagine there's anything in in OSP that you know would preclude you to be running RDO. I really don't think so. You know, I have to be honest with you. We're we're using the products here for a reason. Um, the the or OpenShift origin on RDO is not something we're we're necessarily focusing on. We're more focusing on uh, Kubernetes upstream rather than you know origin scalability because we like to fix the issues in queue as soon as we possibly can and from the OpenStack standpoint we did the same thing where we work everything upstream and rdo becomes an integration point so i don't i'm not aware of any restrictions around that though so it, you know mileage may vary but hopefully you're lucky and if you do it then we'll definitely get you to talk about it so let us know what happens Is there anybody else out there? I know Sandeep, your microphone wasn't quite working. So um, it looked like he bopped off. I thought he might bop back in. So I would also, um, while we're pausing here and people are thinking if they have any questions, we're going to have our um, first face-to-face -face meeting of the OpenShift and OpenStack SIG at the OpenShift gathering November 7th at KubeCon in Seattle. Um, and I typed into the chat room the link to get to um, registering for the gathering. So we'd love to have you come. Um, Jed will be there. I think Jeremy's going to be there for part of it. Um, and we're going to have a, a, at lunch, we have an hour and a half set aside for all the SIG meetings. Um, so if, you, if you're going to KubeCon, please come the day before and, and join us. Um, the URL to get there is commons.openshift.org slash gathering. And um, we'll, we'd love to have you there. And it looks like that was all of the questions we have. The question I now have for you, and I think Judd has for you too, is um, what would people like to hear for um, the next um, topic for, and maybe we're going to do these bi-monthly, so in two months to do another talk on open shift on OpenStack or something related to OpenStack that we should be looking at. Um, you know, talking more about the load balancers or, you know, if there's a topic that's near and dear to your heart, sign up for the mailing list, um, which is on the, uh, also on the commons.openship.org site and um, let us know. I, I haven't created the mailing list yet, so um, that is one of my tasks and to-dos today, so I will add you all to it um, if you sign up. Um, but if there's anything else, Judd, is there anything near and dear to your heart that we, we, you think we ought to cover in the next one? Yeah, a couple of things actually. Um, the productization of the OpenShift on OpenStack project, um, their, their code's really good. Um, uh, I was wondering if you guys had used that project in your work to create the heat templates necessary and drive them. Um, that was really my question. How much of the under uh, the over cloud heat templates did you have to hack up from what um, OSP is delivering you uh, out of the box. 
Uh, so for this test, we didn't use the heat templates for the open shift on the open, we didn't use the open shift on open stack heat templates that uh, I believe heat was used to deploy some of the nodes that we had. So, okay. yeah, um, but, but I, I would say this, Judd, is that uh, we have prototyped OpenShift 3.4 on OpenStack 10 with those templates. We have at least five patches that we're carrying now to make that happen. So it's not not bad at all. And our next version of this stuff will definitely be using those templates. Cool, because I'm especially interested for my customers in upgrade paths. And having well-defined templates makes upgrade somewhat tractable. And so you don't want to have to redeploy your entire <laughs> your entire network in order to upgrade through OSPs and through OpenShifts and even through, say, Dell BIOS updates or mm -hmm. driver updates. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to meeting you again. Actually, we saw each other at Red Hat Summit. Um, and uh, um, yeah, folks, hit me with I with ideas for uh, future calls. Um, we've got a lot of knowledge here in within Dell about um, managing and scaling the OpenStack and OpenShift networks. Um, the storage is is uh, um, is really strong at Dell, <laughs> considering we, we also merged with. So we have a, a wide variety of, of enterprise and SMB mid-market um, storage products that we've been testing with OpenStack and OpenShift uh, to let you know how they're working, what kind of integration is going on. See, whenever I deploy, I'm deploying on to uh, equal logic boxes for all my storage. Um, I've got a, a, a slightly different layout and uh, would like to um, see where folks are hitting problems or, or success stories around Cinder integration with different storage backends. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this relationship. And as, as, uh, as Red Hat looks more at integrating uh, the OpenStack services with OpenShift services, there's going to be a lot more to talk about. Um, so thanks so much. And I really hope to see you folks in Seattle. Yeah, that would be great. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, and we will I'll reach out to Sandeep and see if I can figure out what his question was. And we will do another one of these in two months, so October, sometime in December. Um, we'll pick a date and we'll post it on the calendar. So you can always find the upcoming events on commons.openshift.org slash briefings. Um, that's where my calendar hides and um, we add all the SIGs and all the briefings and upcoming events there. So um, looking forward to meeting you all in person at the gathering in Seattle and also going to KubeCon. So take care and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you.